Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. Just want to welcome everyone here in our parking lot service. Go wave. <laughs> it's great to see everyone here in person today, even if it's through the windshield. And anyone else that might be listening in on, is it uh, FM 103.1, right? Yeah. Just want to welcome you all here to today's service. Looking forward to a time of just worshiping the Lord through song and then uh, remembering him in communion and finally learning from him through Pastor Al delivering the word today. So I'd like everyone just to uh, join with me in a word of prayer and then we'll get into a time of worship this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you, God. As different as this is from the way we might like to be worshiping, Lord, we're still here. We're still celebrating our individual relationships with you and still celebrating you as a body of Christ as well. God, there's no limit to you, Lord. As much as we're limited by our own fragile bodies and health, our you know, governments and policies, everything that goes on in this world, Lord, there's no limit to the amount of worship we can give to you or the amount of worship that you'll accept from us, God. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for seeing us through these times, for all the blessings you continue to pour into our lives. And thank you, Lord, especially for the forgiveness of sins that you offer through your death on the cross, God. Thank you so much for rising again on the third day to give us an eternity with you, Lord. God, this, this time is our reaction to the wondrous blessings that you've laid out before us. God, we know we can't repay it. We just want to respond to you this morning. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. forever. We know that 
But you are a rock in our salvation all of our lives. to invite uh, Brother Mike Langham up to give us a communion devotion this morning. I'd like to read from the uh, Gospel of Luke, starting with verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, I just, this always startled me at this one, because who was going to let her in to his house? So Simon's house. I mean, I remember when I was in Israel, we, we saw, supposedly, St. Peter's house by the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum, I believe, and they built a Catholic church on top of it. But it was still, it was kind of, 
you know, I'm trying to picture this house where Jesus came in, reclined, and then all these Pharisees, which later on we learn they were there too, let this woman come in. And I just, I thought, well, that's kind of a, why did they? Well, let's see. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee, who was Simon, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man was a prophet, he would know who was, touch, who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now, the word Pharisee and narcissist are actually mean the same thing. No, they don't, but they should be. She answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. See, that's, that was a custom of them that they, people come into your home, you, you clean their feet. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. I, I said, well, wait, wait a minute, Lord. She didn't really repent. I didn't, hear, I didn't hear where she repented. I mean, she just did stuff to you, but I didn't hear her repent. As her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven, little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, again, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's, that's all this woman did. Jesus never told her, this one, go and sin no more. He, he had before in the past. But he didn't tell her, you know, you need to ask for forgiveness. She worshipped him. She gave her his heart, her heart. She knew what she had done. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew her heart. Um. And, it's, you know, it's funny, I, again, you know, the Pharisees knew who, what kind of woman she was, and so did Jesus. You can't put, pull, you know, Jesus knew what kind of woman she was. But the woman basically just worshipped Christ and knew if there was a way for her to be saved, it was through him. That was the way. Amen. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus. Lord, we thank you that just like the woman, God, you know our hearts. You know what we do. Sometimes we don't need to even say anything, Lord, but you can see inside us. You can see what, what we long for. But Lord, we long to be with you. We long to be right with you. We long to be the person, the people that you created. Lord, no, we're not perfect. You know we're not perfect, God. That's why your son came and died on the cross. Even to forgive the Pharisees, if they would turn their lives over to you and not look towards the law, because the law never saved anyone, and it still won't. Jesus, only you save through your blood. In Jesus' name I, I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Mike. And now, if you do have uh, elements of communion, either bread or uh, a drink to represent his blood, feel free to take those at, these, at this time. And we're going to sing the last song of our worship set today. I sing praises to your name. Sing praises to your name, oh Lord, praises to your name, oh Lord, for your name is 
Phil and Ray, Irwin behind the scenes. Everybody can hear me okay? Very good. And uh, Mike, excellent uh, devotion. Touched my heart. Really did. Welcome Trinity Christian Fellowship. It is good to be together. I'm taking this off right now. I want you to know you are loved and cherished. And I enjoy this time of being together with you. Uh, looking forward to time when we're face to face and all's good that way. Meanwhile, this is good. This is good. I'm not going to be reflecting on what could have been. I'm enjoying what we got. Bird in hand, right? <laughs> Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God in heaven. Uh, we have lots to be thankful for, Lord. But on top of that, Lord, we have lots to be concerned about as well. And we ask you to help us with the burdens and the concerns that weigh down on our brains and our hearts. Lord, obviously, COVID is surging many places and is striking closer and closer to home all the time. Lord, obviously, for rain, we need that. We please send more. Uh, it's hard to go on with life without water. But even more than that, what's on our head right now is the hostility that is in our country and the anger the uncivil incivility that is now kind of defining our nation it's been going that way for months or years now but lord it's raised its head pretty nasty this week i pray father you'd help us we have zero control over anything except ourselves but lord i pray that you'd cause us and all christians to be able to ask for your holy spirit to raise up inside of us the fruits of the spirit that Galatians 5, the, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Lord, let everything that is not of that, that we read, that we hear, that, that is out there, Lord, let us spit it out and renounce it and have nothing to do with it but focus on our Jesus. Holy Spirit, wash us out. We got too much kibble in between our ears. 
Lord, give us hope for tomorrow. Lord, I pray you'd turn us into a nation of praying people, praying like Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turning your Bibles to the book of John chapter 11. The whole chapter, matter of fact, in our series that we're getting back into on the life of Christ, there are some pretty large sections of scripture we're going to be covering. And so you're going to really be needing to read ahead before each time. So because there's very little we're actually touching, but you need to know it all in that respect before we get into it. This is a section on the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus is going there. It's during a funeral, and the funeral is back then was quite a social event. That's why I talk about the social occasion of the resurrection. 57 verses is chapter 11 of John. Only seven verses have to do actually with the resurrection. The other 50 verses talk about the buildup to the resurrection and then the aftermath of the resurrection, the social setting. Because, again, funerals nowadays can be rather social events in which people see old friends or old relatives they haven't seen for a while. I remember there was one time I went back to a church after I'd been pastoring here for just a few years. I went to a church that I used to be in and... Uh, someone there had passed away, but I wasn't officiating. I wasn't even speaking. I wasn't in charge of anything. It was rather freeing. I could go afloat around and visit whoever I wanted. And one person asked, what's it like to be back in the room, the building in which you used to preach, you used to call the shots, you used to be in charge of everything, and now you don't have to do anything. And I said, I don't mind going to any funeral as long as I'm not the guest of honor. <laughs> It was fun to be able to socialize. Jesus comes to this funeral, and there's different segments there. Just like if you go into a cafeteria at a middle school, and you see certain kids sit at certain tables, and you kind of wonder where you belong. Well, this is going on, and uh, Jesus knows that no matter what table you're sitting at, no matter what group you're part of, there is one thing you desperately need. You have different ideas, different views on everything. But there is one thing that each group needs, and that is a concept of the glory of God. And that's what the resurrection is about, the glory of God. Uh, look at the verse 4, which summarizes the whole event. Jesus is saying, verse 4, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. If you look down near the end, closer to verse 40, Jesus is talking to Martha and says, you want to see the glory of God? I will show you the glory of God. And that's going to be in the resurrection. But we get, before we get back to that glory, let's look at the three different groups that are the biggest ones he's dealing with in this chapter. The, you know, three different tables in the middle school cafeteria. The first is the disciples. And the disciples' biggest concern is Jesus' safety. Jesus' safety. In verse 8, when Jesus is saying, we're getting ready to go back to Bethany to resurrect Lazarus, it says, verse 8, the disciples said, but Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? They were concerned. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see a map on the screen off to the right-hand side. And you see, when Jesus starts this chapter 11, he's in Perea, which is a region east of the Jordan River. This was John the Baptist's old stomping grounds. It's an area that's in a different jurisdiction than Jerusalem, so he's safe from the authorities there. It's also a sympathetic group of people, so he can hide amongst the population fairly easy there. But in order for him to go to Bethany, he has to cross the Jordan and go within two miles of Jerusalem. He's, uh, he's in a dangerous area there. By the time he's done with the 11th chapter, he kind of goes to another area called Ephraim, which is further up north. You can see it on the map. And at that point, uh, he's also in a different jurisdiction. So he's playing with some boundaries here. But uh, Jesus is going to a place in Jerusalem where he's a wanted man. Last time, two times he went there, they tried to kill him. He's in danger there. 
It's in this context that the Apostle Thomas says something incredible. In verse 16, it says this. Then Thomas, known as Didymus, means the twin, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas says this. Now, most of us know Thomas from a different story, right? What's the nickname for Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Uh, but it's best not to know a person by their worst day, which is that was Thomas's. This is a time in which Thomas is looking at Jesus, knowing he's a goner if he goes near Jerusalem. And he says to the rest of the disciples, let's not let him die by himself. Let's be faithful to him unto death. This is an incredible thing that Thomas is saying. So let's not throw him out when, because he lacked faith after the resurrection. Okay, he maybe wasn't ready to live. He was ready to die, but he wasn't ready to live. But nonetheless, uh, their concern for the, as the disciples was for Jesus' safety. The second group that we come across is the group of Martha and Mary, their household. Verses 20 to 40 excuse me, but their context is disappointment, disappointment. But before we talk about the disappointment, I want to talk about another person who has a moment of valor that we shouldn't just kind of dismiss them because they had a bad day in another story. And that person is Martha. We talked about Martha a few stories but go before, uh, go before our Lament Psalm series. And uh, Martha was entertaining Jesus, but Mary, Mary wasn't helping, so Martha complains to Jesus. Jesus pushes back, puts her in her place, says, Mary made the good call, not you, Martha. That might be enough for a person to hold back. But when Jesus shows up in Bethany and the people in the house know that Jesus is out there, Martha goes to meet Jesus. Mary doesn't. Mary stays inside the house. Martha goes on out. She makes an incredible confession of faith in Jesus in verse 27, one of the best in the Bible. But she also has some very theologically um, accurate, beautiful statements about the resurrection in verse 22 and 24. Some people have said, if you wanted to make the apostle Peter into a woman, that would be Martha. She is an incredible person. She really is. But all that being said, it, all that being said, let's deal with the disappointment angle. When Jesus is approached by Martha, the first phrase out of Martha's mouth is in verse 21, and it says this: "Martha said to Jesus, "Lord, if you had been uh, here, my brother would not have died." That's the greeting he he gets. His are like, "Well, hello to you too, Martha. <laughs> How would you like to be greeted that way?" The thing is, is that not too long after that, Martha tells somebody to go get Mary to get out of the house and come out and greet Jesus. And Mary says the exact same thing to Jesus in verse 32. Well, hello to you, Mary. Good to see you too. The thing is, if you have lost a loved one, whether it's a long protracted disease, maybe it was a very rapidly short disease, maybe it was an accident that you could have done something about maybe there are two words that will haunt you for years if only right how many of you dealt with ifs before if only we gone to the doctor sooner if only we took it more seriously if we only we didn't buy them that red sports car <laughs> if only and that's what these two ladies are dealing with first thing out of their mouth if only they're lamenting. They're grieving. What does Jesus do? He gets this greeting from them. He laments too. He grieves. Like it says, Jesus wept. He joins them in that weeping, in that lamenting. Now, the thing I can say is it's kind of odd because Jesus knew in a couple of minutes he was going to resurrect Lazarus. Everything was going to change in a couple of minutes. He still takes time to stop and weep. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. When people have been put through the ringer, it's still time to lament. And he joins them in lament. This isn't the only time. Jesus, in a few stories after this, is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's going to die the next day on Good Friday. 
But Jesus already knows he's going to resurrect. He knows that. But Jesus isn't in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, eh, you know, I, I guess death, death is kind of going to hurt a little bit, I guess. But it's going to be okay, no big deal. I'm going to resurrect. That's not a problem. I'll cruise right through it. He doesn't do that, does he? He sweats bullets. He sobs. Why? Because you're supposed to lament sometimes. You really are. Even if you know it's all going to be okay in the end. Book of Isaiah 53 verse 3. Famous chapter. Isaiah 53 verse 3. Famous verse. It says this. uh, Prophecy of the Messiah. It says he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The Messiah is supposed to weep. Why? Because life sometimes needs weeping. That's how it is. Um, Rick Warren, pastor at Saddleback, wrote some great books and, and uh, has a very good ministry going there. He and his wife, Kay, his wife's name, Kay, they've had an adult son who had, had a lot of severe mental health issues, primarily depression. And they did everything right. They had a wonderful church community around them, helping them at every turn. Yet nonetheless, a day came in which their son took his own life, even though they did everything right. On approaching the one-year anniversary of their son's death, Kay went to social media to talk to some of her friends. And she said, many of you hope that we could get on with things, get over it. You want us to get back to normal. You want the old Rick and the old K back. Then she said, the old Rick and the old K aren't coming back. Some things like this change you forever. Do you heal? Yeah. But some things do stick. It's called weeping. It's called grief. It's called lament. And that's the way that the Lord said it should be. And that's where Martha and Mary are stuck at the time. After this, before we get to the third group, Jesus does the resurrection. And in verse 43, he has a simple three-word phrase. It goes like this. Verse 43, when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Great phrase. Great phrase. Uh, Actually, in, in Greek, there's not even a verb in there. It reads more like, Lazarus, this way, out. To me, it's almost like a direction of a a, a stewardess directing people where they deploy from the plane or a person at a big convention area showing where every people are supposed to go. Lazarus, this way out. Follow the sound of my voice. I know your face is covered with rags. I know that you can't really see anything because you're blindfolded and tied up, but follow the sound of your voice. This is exciting for me because of this. Someday, I'm going to die. And someday, you're going to die. And someday after that, Jesus is going to come back and resurrect us. Now, I do not know how to die. Never done it before. Lack the experience. I also do not know how to resurrect. But if this story is any indication, all I have to do is hear the voice of my Jesus. Him saying, Al, this way, out. Follow the sound of my voice. Come to me. Looking forward to that wonderful voice. Well, the last group we're looking at, we're calling them the Sanhedrin. They're the group that's kind of the big uh, group of uh, judges or legislators, so to speak, of the area. There's the Great Sanhedrin, which is based in Jerusalem. Each town also had their mini Sanhedrin. We're not sure which one this is, but it's probably the Jerusalem one. And uh, they're a group that's also represented at this funeral. Verse 45 and 46 says this, Therefore many Jews who had come to visit Mary, had seen what Jesus did and believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. When it comes to resurrection, some trust Jesus, others tattle on Jesus. And these people, they tattled on Jesus to the Pharisees who were part of and went to the Sanhedrin from there. Once inside the Sanhedrin, there was a little debate that's going in these verses. In verse 48 we got an interesting uh, verse. 
Somebody in the group is saying this. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Now listen to that. If Lazarus is resurrected, the Romans will come and destroy our country and our religion. That's what they're saying. I'm sorry, but I don't see the connection between the two. Do you? Jesus had already resurrected two people and nothing happened. In a few days, Jesus is going to be in front of Pilate, who's the Romans' authority there in the area. And and Pilate says, I have no problem with this guy. But for these people, they shout out that uh, if Lazarus is resurrected, the Romans are going to come and destroy everything. You know what we call people like this? They're alarmists. They try to get you f- afraid of something that you really can't see. Sort of like a blaring uh, car horn that g- goes off alarm. Nobody's breaking into it, but it's still irritating, isn't it? And hard to ignore. Alarmists, like these people, we all know that there are lots of alarmists in the world. Everybody is saying, you know, if your child does this, they'll screw up their life forever. If you don't do this diet or do that, it'll screw up your health. You know, if this person gets into office, it'll be the end of the Western civilization and so on. There's the alarmists who go on and on and on. If I could use alarmists to get you alarmed about alarmism, I would do so, but that would be hypocritical. I should tell you, alarmists are out to destroy us all. Dissolve the universe, maybe. Who knows? The thing is, is that in this case, in alarmism, These people say the Romans are coming. They're going to destroy Jerusalem, our nation. They'll destroy the temple. Well, eventually, that part came true. The Romans did come in 70 AD, 40 years later, and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. The thing is, it had nothing to do with Jesus. It had nothing to do with Lazarus or resurrection or the church or Christians or the gospel or anything. The Christians had cleared out by then. You know what it had to do with? The Jewish people decided, hey, let's ignore the Romans, let's not pay our taxes, and let's rebel. Imagine that. Then the Romans came and (laughs) gave them problems. Here's the thing. Alarmists oftentimes point at everybody else as being the cause of the destruction that's happening, and oftentimes it's the alarmist who is bringing on the destruction that they're accusing everybody else of. A little bit later in that section, in verse, uh, and by the way, in verse 49, it's interesting. Caiaphas, who's the head of Sanhedrin, talks to these alarmists, and he says, you guys know nothing. Amen. <laughs> the alarmists are morons. But then he says in verse 50, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. Verse 51, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. Now, in this, what Caiaphas thinks he's saying is, it's better for us just to throw Jesus under the bus. The Romans will be able to kick somebody around and the rest of us can get off scot-free. That's what he's intending to say. But what he's actually saying is, Jesus is dying for our sins. That's what he's actually saying, and it's a prophecy. Now, in many respects, I have a problem with a prophetic gift being given to a horrible person like Caiaphas. He was horrible. And in some respects, I think in my back of my mind, like in Philippians 2, it says, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's an important thing, the glory of God the Father. That's what we kind of started with as the purpose of the resurrection. But in this, um, I kind of wonder... Okay, God, you're going to cause everybody to say something good about Jesus. The believers will have no problem doing that. How are you going to get horrible people to do it? Well, at the end times, I suppose, yeah. But even on the last day of Jesus' life, his praises were being said by horrible people. Think about it. One is Caiaphas right here. Another one, Pilate, who was a horrible person who said of Jesus, I find no reason for guilt in this man. He also said, King of the Jews. You're right, Pilate, on both counts. Horrible person saying the right thing. How about the people who were standing around the cross mocking Jesus? They said, he saved others, let him save himself. That's right. 
mockers, Jesus is a savior. The centurion, who was a horrible person, killing lots of people. He said, surely this man is the what? The son of God. Wow. And if nobody else, Judas, a horrible person, says, I have betrayed innocent blood. Yeah, Jesus was innocent. You see, on the last day of Jesus' life, instead of him patting himself on the back and saying how great he is, he let his enemies, the horrible people, to be actually the ones that are saying the good things about him, like it said back in Philippians 2, so that God is glorified. And that is the thrust here in the resurrection for Lazarus. Because there are people that are, have all sorts of different kibble between their ears, all sorts of different problems in the world. We turn on the radio, the TV, media, and we get a lot of venom out there. And we all have different experiences. But we need to know one thing, that beyond there is a pure, holy, powerful thing called the glory of God. And no matter what your dirt or your experience or your confusion or your convictions, that is purity that God wants us to be able to experience, the glory of God. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, help us in the midst of all the stuff that is going on in our world to never lose sight of the purity that is you and the holiness that is you. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now let's say our benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Stay safe, stay healthy.